Morning. Morning. Forgot to turn my mic on. <laughs> Uh, how many are proud of those decisions that were made and the people who stepped into the waters of baptism today? Isn't that great? Yeah. Uh, this whole year we've been talking about thriving and certainly that's one of the steps you take to thrive, uh, not just in, in spiritual life but also physical life, is, is, is to follow Christ. In fact, uh, we've been talking about how you thrive this year and we've looked at the wisdom of God. We thrive when we have access to God's wisdom. We looked at emotional and spiritual health. Sometimes we choose between those things. And there's great wisdom in being both emotionally and spiritually healthy. And then we talked about uh, freedom. We, we tend to thrive when we have freedom. And we've talked about the Holy Spirit. We tend to thrive when we have uh, the Holy Spirit living in us and working with us. And then there's one other thing I'd like us to look at before we get out of this year. And that is that we tend to thrive when we do what Jesus says. Uh, a lot of people think that Jesus only has one or two commands in Scripture. There's a couple that are super well known, for example, uh, uh, that love the Lord your God uh, uh, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and then uh, he's, he's also known to say that uh, we should treat others as we want to be treated. But some people think Jesus didn't have any more commands than that. I went through the Gospels and looked up every time Jesus said something that he expected us to follow through on. And believe it or not, there are 38 commands of Jesus. Uh, do not worry, we are not going to cover all 38 today. We're, we're going to cover one uh, today. But what you need to know about these commands of Jesus is they're very countercultural, Not just back then, but today as well. Like when you look at the, Jesus, at the things that Jesus called us to do and the ways he called us to live, we don't see that modeled uh, in the culture around us. It's never been true of humanity. Jesus, when he talks and he teaches, he, he's not trying to get likes and subscriptions. He's trying to make disciples. That requires a different kind of conversation. And so that's why Jesus talks the way that he does. So in Matthew, the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 12, it says, when Jesus heard that John, and this is John the baptizer, had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulon and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach. And here's the command. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's interesting that uh, John or uh, Matthew starts this passage by saying that Jesus withdrew. We don't hear a lot about the withdrawing Jesus. And his withdrawing wasn't based out of some kind of fear. It's actually a response to wisdom. And it's something he learned in the time of his temptation. What we see of Jesus is that he learned through the temptations that he went through in the wilderness that you can't just take systems and take control and impose your will. That was offered to him, but he understood intuitively and spiritually that that would not be a good thing. And then there was also a temptation to prove himself, to, to do something that everyone would go, well, there, there, there's no doubt about who he is and, and what his uh, requirements are in our world. And he refused uh, to do that. He was tempted to try to get attention and approval. He was tempted to try to take control and work the systems of this world. And he withdraws from those things. And he goes to a place that's called Galilee, which to us doesn't mean much, but it's actually a place that's far from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is the epicenter of spirituality. It's, it's where the temple is. It's where all the well-known priests and theologians are. It's where all the important spiritual things happen. So, so why isn't Jesus there? 
He, he's moved to a place that's far from there. And not only is it geographically far, there's interesting facets to, to Galilee that are very different from Jerusalem. One is, is that spiritually, they're also far. Uh, they weren't as uh, hyper-attentive uh, to the, the, the rules and the regulations uh, out in Galilee as they were in the city of Jerusalem for those people who were followers of God. But also, it was a place where there was a higher population of paganism, and it's this odd environment where there's this regular interaction of people who uh, understand something about God and then people who don't accept anything about God. And Jesus goes there, which is really encouraging to me because I think that that expresses a lot of what's going on in our culture today. There are a lot of people who understand something about God and they may have some strong opinions, but uh, there's a lot of latitude in people's thinking regarding those things. And then there are some people who don't understand anything about God and they're pretty sure God is actually responsible for most of the problems in our world. And this is where Jesus goes. And because he went to Galilee, that was actually used against him in his ministry because the, the general consensus was if you came from Gal Galilee, uh, you, you didn't have anything to do with uh, messianic ministry or prophetic ministry, that that was just a region that God didn't do anything significant and nothing good came out of. And, and so Jesus is often discounted, discredited, just because of, of where his ministry is launched. And, and here we see that Matthew turns that around. He sees in scripture something that gives us insight as to why Jesus was there. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Zebulon and Naphtali, Jesus ministered there. It's a place where light and dark seem to be co-residents. But what, Jesus, what Matthew sees is that people are living in darkness. Now, if suddenly all the lights went out in this room, uh, some of us would be more anxious than others of us. Probably all of us would look to make our way out of this room. And in the darkness, we will all be able to get out of the room. It will take a little longer because uh, we're a little bit apprehensive about what we don't see. And so it has an effect on us. We move slower and our anxiety level goes up. And so what, what Matthew is saying is in a culture where people seem to be paralyzed in some regard, they're not able to do the things that are necessary for their lives. And in an area where people's anxiety levels tend to be higher, that's where the light of Jesus comes and shines. And once the lights come back on, we all feel a lot better about our movement and our actions. So Jesus begins to talk about God's kingdom. And he says that the kingdom of God is available to anyone. This is not typical teaching because the understanding was that the kingdom in the New Testament under Judaism, the kingdom was political and the kingdom was only available to two groups of people. One, people who were born into the ethnicity of Judaism, and secondly, those who became proselytes or followers of Judaism, and they entered into that. And everybody else, they were excluded. And Jesus insists that the kingdom is available for anyone. And he tells us, how do you access that? How do you, how do you connect with that? How do, you, how do you find your way towards that? To know what the kingdom is doing and to partner with that in some way in your life. And he surprises us by how we access this. He tells us the way we do this is to repent. Repent. And when I say that word, it means something to you. And it's entirely possible that it means something to you that it doesn't mean in the Bible. Most people, when they hear the word repent, what they think about is regret. You have to feel really bad about yourself and about the things that you've done, about the places you've been, about the things that you've said. It, their definition of repent is regret. And then there are other people uh, that, that, that when they think about repent, they see it as a change of behavior. 
So uh, let's suppose that you like chocolate chip cookies as I do. <clears throat> and let's suppose you eat more chocolate chip cookies than you're supposed to as I do. Now, let's suppose that you feel bad about that. Well, that's regret, but that's not repentance. All right? And then you can say, well, change your behavior. And, and changing your behavior means that you wouldn't eat any more chocolate chip cookies. Which is a problem because I think there's going to be chocolate chip cookies in heaven. And why would I give them up now? It makes absolutely no sense at all. This is the thing. People who think that change behavior is repentance don't understand that it's not. Change behavior is the fruit of repentance. It's not the act of repentance. And consequently, a lot of people just feel bad and they try to change their behavior, but they never really repent. And the result is, is that they don't seem to make any significant ground for any sustained amount of time in their life. They, they take, may make a little progress and then something happens or fails to happen and they fall backwards. Jesus says, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near, and this is good news. There's a kingdom mentality, and, and this is so important to us because until we learn what repentance actually is, we'll wind up working around it and then failing as a result of it. So repentance is how we prepare for what God wants to do. Repentance is how we prepare for what God wants to do. Anybody been to a wedding? Anybody been in a wedding? Anybody know that there are people who, when they think about their wedding day and how they want to look on that day, adjust their dietary intake considerably, right? And I, I'm so glad that people take pictures on their wedding day. I think pictures should be taken on our wedding day because that's as good as we're ever going to look in our entire lives. It just is. And you should have evidence that, that you were capable of that at least once. Uh, how do we prepare ourselves for God's kingdom? Repent. God's kingdom is breaking into our world and breaking into our lives. So how can we orient ourselves so that we're aware of it, connect to it, participate with it? The answer is repent. John the Baptist preached the same message, and he would say this. <clears throat> he, he made the distinction between repentance and, and, and the fruit of repentance. And uh, what's really interesting in, in, the, uh, in the biblical world of Judaism and, uh, and the early New Testament, uh, baptism was not for everybody. Baptism was not for, if you were born Jewish, you were never baptized. You were born Jewish, you didn't need to be baptized. Baptism was only for people, only for people who wanted to become followers of the Jewish God. And so they would be baptized. And here's a real, another interesting thing, uh, that uh, nobody ever baptized another person. They baptized themselves. They would go and they would dip down in water while God's word was spoken over them. And, and John the Baptist comes along and he says, nope, everybody, Jew, Gentile, everybody, you got to get wet. You got to go in. You, you got to go under. That's how it works. And by the way, nobody's baptizing themselves. You have to have somebody else baptize you. It was a complete reorientation. And, and people would come to him and they would say, we, we want to be baptized. And he would, say, he would say something that's not kind. He would say, you brood of vipers. Now, you can call somebody a dog. And there can be positive and negative connotations to that expression. You can call somebody an animal. There can be positive and negative connotations to that. But if you call somebody a snake, I've never heard a positive expression of that. And, and brood, brood of snakes. What, what is a brood? It's, it's not brood like coffee. It's, it's, it's brood like offspring. What he's saying is, you little snake children. Aren't you glad I didn't start my message like that today? You little snake children. Uh, what is he saying? By the way, there's two people in Scripture that have used that term. John is one, and Jesus is the other. Isn't that fascinating? And they're, both of them, their major concept is repentance. What are they saying? And what they're reminding us of is the original serpent. All the way back to the first humans who lived in a garden that was considered paradise. And a serpent enters in, and he suggests to them that maybe God is withholding good things from you. 
and you can't really trust him for your best life and for, and for yourself. You better learn how to take some things into your own hands because if you trust God, you're going to have less, you're going to be less. And so both Adam and Eve and every human sense have taken that position where I can't really trust God for these kinds of things in my life. I better take matters into my own hands. And the result is, is that uh, we, we, we become snake children. We distrust God's motives. We distrust his heart. And it affects our actions. Like you, if you don't trust somebody, you will definitely behave differently as a result of that. And, and uh, uh, um, uh, John the baptizer basically boiled his message down. What, what is the fruit of repentance? And he talked about a couple things. One is he talked about generosity. He would say, if you have two coats, share your coat with somebody, your extra coat with somebody who doesn't have a coat. And, and he also talks about it this way. If you're producing some kind of product, don't charge people more than is necessary for it. Like you can make a profit. You don't need to become uh, obnoxiously wealthy as a result of something that you produce. And so uh, a lot of people struggle with those two concepts, the concepts of, of honesty and the concepts of generosity. With generosity, sometimes we're just afraid. If, if I give something away, I will have less. And, and what it is, is it's a failure to see, right? We don't perceive God in the correct way. What I have is actually a gift from him. He's already been generous to me. That's why I have something to give. And the God who has been generous will continue to be generous. But we're afraid. If, if we don't see God as generous, then we better hold on to what we have. Or materialism, which basically tells us that, that if we have things, our value goes up. The more we have, the more we're worth. And not just in terms of a financial amount, but our status, our identity. We're worth more. Or maybe we have a, a past experience where someone took advantage of our generosity. That can really throw cold water on us. Or, or maybe a lack, of, a lack of awareness. There's, there's actually opportunities to be generous, but we don't even see them. We don't know about them. Uh, sometimes we feel like everything I have is a result of my effort and my work. And if other people don't have things, they just need to get to work. They need to do what I did. And is this how God thinks? Is this God's heart? No, but it can often be ours. Sometimes it's, it's just unresolved emotional issues. Like if you struggle with forgiveness or distrust, it is very hard to be generous with someone that you distrust or someone you can't forgive. Um, sometimes we just don't manage our resources very well at all. We, we, and so we wind up, we have an impulse to be generous, but we have no resource to follow through on that impulse. Uh, sometimes we're just raised in families. That's not how we're taught. Sometimes we don't understand a biblical concept of generosity. We won't learn this anywhere in our culture. The only place we'll learn this is in Scripture. And if we've not been exposed to that, we'll, we'll struggle with it. And, and uh, so people don't become more generous by forcing resources out of their hand. You can get something from them, but that's not the same as them becoming generous. And so people go right to, let's force people to give up something that they have and then the, there'll, there'll be some kind of equity. Okay, but, but there's no change. In fact, what you will have is, is a person who's even more resentful because you took something from them that they thought was completely theirs. Right? So this is how our world works. Or, or how about the issue of, of honesty? Some of us really struggle with honesty because we know there's some consequence. If we tell the truth, you know, your, your spouse made a meal for you and you're tasting it. And, and they're asking you, so how is it? And you will lie. Because <laughs> you don't want the problem that comes after the honest conversation. You know? Some people are more diplomatic. They'll say, hmm, where did you get this recipe? <laughs> uh, sometimes we just want to be approved by others. And so we will say what we need to say to hear what we want to hear. And that's not honest. Sometimes we just want to preserve ourselves. We know we're going to lose something. Something's going to happen to us if we're honest. But instead of protecting and preserving ourselves, we actually erode our character and our soul. Some people have actually developed a habit of dishonesty. They actually uh, lie easier than they tell the truth. They, even when there's no reason to. You probably know somebody like that. 
Um, sometimes it's just guilt and shame. They don't want to say the truth because they don't want to feel guiltier and more shame than they already do. And sometimes people are dishonest because they've learned how to manipulate with their dishonesty. They can say things that aren't true to get something that they, they want. There's all kinds of reasons that we would be dishonest. And, and people who struggle with dishonesty also try to protect themselves. Their, themselves. But while they're trying to protect themselves, their character and their soul are eroding. Um, until we change our perception about something, lies will be our native language. And so we can try to say, you need to change your behavior. But if we don't go through the process of repentance, under pressure, we will revert back to what we perceive has helped us at least at some points in our life. So we have to focus on something else. Repentance, repentance is a change of mind and a change of heart. We have to see things differently. As long as you see God as some kind of ancient, austere judge who's looking for a reason to take something out on you, to catch you in something so he can disqualify you, as long as you see God like that, you're going to have a very hard time in terms of your behavior. But, and, and by the way, uh, when I say that, there are some people who go, if God's going to judge me anyway, I'll just do what I want. And then there are some people who go, oh, if God's going to judge me, I'll try to live the perfect life. But of course, we disappoint ourselves when we realize we can't really be perfect. The fruit of repentance flows out of our understanding. We see God, we see ourselves, we see our world differently. We see them the way God does. Then we get to experience the fruit of repentance. So who, who do you trust in? Uh, who do you trust in? Who, who do you gain hope from? Who do you get confidence from? And uh, if our confidence uh, is just because things are going well for us and we think we cracked the code, if our hope is because we got into the school we wanted, we got the job we wanted, we got the spouse we wanted, we, we, things are going well for us. If that's the basis of our hope, I've got really bad news for you in that every single person without exception experiences a downturn in a number of circumstances in our life. Uh, we'll walk into a doctor's office and, and they're gonna tell us something we don't wanna hear. We'll be in a relationship and that person will tell us something we don't wanna hear. A company will downsize. There's always something, always something that happens in life, always something. And if our confidence is in how well we're doing, that's that's going to get eroded pretty quickly. If our hope is in the opportunities right in front of us, there'll be times when there's no opportunity. So, so what can our confidence, what can our hope, what can our identity be in? And it can be, can be in what's been done for us. It can be in, in who God is and his heart. It can be in the fact that we understand not only is he always aware what's going on in our lives, and he always cares what's going on in our lives, but he's always working in our lives. Uh, the reason we ignore God's commands, we just don't trust him. We don't trust his heart, we, we don't trust his wisdom. So if, if, we, if we try to create the fruit of repentance without actual repentance, uh, some things begin to happen in our lives. One is we'll, we'll become proud. We'll look down on other people. We can become very judgmental because we think this, the strength of our will has, has given us this capacity, why, why can't they? And then we can also become very discouraged because eventually, eventually you will fail. So when that happens, we all experience the same thing. It occurs to us, we've been operating in the land of shadows and darkness. But scripture tells us that in the land of shadows and darkness, a great light shines. And that light is Jesus. And Jesus shines light not only help us understand who God is and who he is, but who we are and what's actually going on in our world. It makes a huge difference. So how did Jesus talk about the kingdom? Well, he talked about the kingdom like this. The kingdom is entering now and there's more to come. It's, it's already begun. While I'm talking, the kingdom has started breaking in and there's even more to come. 
How many are glad that God is not done in the work he's doing in our world? This isn't as good as it gets, right? It isn't as good as it gets. This is fantastic. And, and then he also says this, the kingdom is a gift, not a reward. The kingdom is a gift, not a reward. He does not say, if you can live the life that you're supposed to live, then God's kingdom will come. That's not what he says. He says, the kingdom is coming in right now. And you can orient yourself toward it through the act of repentance. It's absolutely amazing. We can miss something that's very near and right here. But through the act of repentance, we can see it all. And the nearness of the kingdom is actually good news to share. This is what's fascinating is the way the kingdom comes is, is not through some kind of political enterprise or economic enterprise or, or, or any of those things. That the way the kingdom of God comes is through the declaration, the telling of the good news. The king has come and he is establishing his kingdom. I'm going to ask the worship team uh, to come out. Uh, the kingdom doesn't enter our political systems. I know that's terribly disappointing to say just before an election. Uh, the kingdom enters human hearts. Our world changes when human hearts change. And we keep trying to produce the fruit of repentance without any repentance. The kingdom of God actually makes a real difference in our lives and in our world. And if we don't repent, if we try to bypass that aspect, if we think I'm just going to impose, strengthen my will, do what I'm supposed to, buck up. Um, we used to tell our kids, dig deep and pull it together. The bad news is it always fails. Jesus wants us to be prepared for what God wants to do in our lives. Think about that. There's all these hopes and dreams God has for you. And all he wants us to do is to orient ourselves in a way that we notice it, we embrace it, we lean into it, we walk in the truth of it. Isn't that amazing? How does this happen? Repentance. And here's the thing. Repentance, repentance is not a one-time event. Repentance is a life skill. It's a life skill. That every single day I can orient myself towards God. Every single day I'm aware of the darkness that's around me and I'm aware of the darkness that's in me. And I am so grateful that the kingdom is breaking into that right now, right where I am regardless of where I am, right there, the kingdom of God is breaking in. And anything I see that looks like is a failure to trust God with my life, right there, I can look to see God differently. How can you see God differently? Because God was willing to give his one and only son to watch him suffer and die a horrible death on a cross so that all of our faults could be forever forgiven. If you ever have any doubt about the heart of God, don't look at your failures. Look at what he did for you in spite of your failures. And when we see that, and we see God for who he really is, the fruit of repentance begins to flow in our lives. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, um, we try, we do, we try so hard. And, and I know you're not telling us we shouldn't do anything, but I know you're telling us that if we try to do this without repentance, that there's no fruit in that. Or whatever fruit we produce is not anything we want. Help us listen to the command of your son today. Repent. See God differently. See yourself differently. See the world around you differently because the kingdom of heaven is right here in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.